At dawn on the 15th of January 1943, the Germans were already withdrawing by the time that the Don Front launched its main offensive. So the Soviets made relatively rapid progress, slowed only by the deep snow. The 44th, 297th and 376th Infantry, plus the 3rd and 29th Motorized Divisions, were basically spent at this point, offering only light resistance during what was the most impressive advance since the beginning of Operation Ring. Duminsky and Basagino were taken by the Soviets, with the 21st Army reaching a point just 3 kilometers from Potomnik Airfield. In the south, the important village of Elki, taken and held by the Germans on the 5th of September 1942, all the way back in episode 16, and had been part of the front line since then, fell to the 66th Naval Rifle Brigade. The remainder of 29th Motorized Division and 376th and 297th Infantry Divisions are finished. 14th Panzer Corps and 4th Army Corps have deficits of 75% of their infantry due to bloody losses and frostbite, minus 35 degrees of cold at night. The resistance capacity of the undernourished and exhausted troops is still quite low. Significant losses of weapons and equipment. Supplies are no longer adequate. Ammunition is still quite sketchy in our troop units. Whether the so-called end positions can hold out for a long period of time is doubtful. By this point, the 6th Army had lost touch with what was happening at the front, and had no choice but to leave the troops to figure things out for themselves. It's likely that the Germans had lost 60,000 troops since the 10th of January, a third of the force it started with, while the Soviets had lost 24,000. And with the pocket collapsing now, Paulus vacated his headquarters from Gumrak Airfield to the former headquarters of 71st Infantry Division, nicknamed Hartmannstadt, Hartmann City. In theory, this move should have freed up Gumrak Airfield for use by the Luftwaffe. But because Gumrak had been occupied by Paulus's headquarters and used as a hospital, the airfield hadn't been allowed to be prepared, which meant it wasn't operational until the last minute. It didn't even have a radio beacon. In clear, cloudless weather, and a temperature ranging down to minus 28 degrees Celsius on January 15th, a mere three HE-111s took off with supplies to Stalingrad. One of these was shot down by Soviet fighters, with 11 men aboard getting killed, and the remaining two planes landed inside the cauldron, delivering a few tons of supplies and evacuating 27 wounded soldiers. The Feldwebel, the last wounded soldier of Hapman Moose's battalion, 16th Panzer Division, to be flown out of the fortress on 15th of January, received a bullet wound in his stomach on the 14th of January. He had been fighting for the previous six days completely without food, so he survived the otherwise fatal wound. Inside the city, Zeidlitz had to consolidate the remaining elements of the 79th Infantry Division into the 212th Regiment, itself still vastly under strength. This then tried to hold against the 138th Rifle Division, which was advancing westwards into the lower Red October village. German forces at the bathhouse and nearby school, the only multi-storey stone buildings in the area, managed to hold off the Soviet units and even launched some failed counterattacks. But even now, the advance inside the city was measured in meters. Previously, Paulus had sent Captain Baer to see Hitler, and Baer had, by now, reached the Führer's headquarters. There are differing accounts of what happened, but the overall picture is largely the same. Hitler tried to bypass Baer by explaining that a new counterattack was being formed that would turn defeat into victory. However, Baer's brother-in-law, Nicholas von Bülow, was Hitler's Luftwaffe adjutant and had warned Baer of this tactic. So when Hitler asked Baer to return to Paulus with the news of this counterattack, Baer simply stated that his orders were to report on the situation in the pocket and he asked Hitler if he could do this now. And with everyone watching them, Hitler couldn't refuse. Baer began to speak and Hitler, rather to his surprise, made no attempt to interrupt him. He did not spare his audience any detail, including the growing desertions of German soldiers to the Russians. Field Marshal Keitel, unable to bear such frankness in the Führer's presence, shook his fist at Bear from behind Hitler's back in an attempt to silence him. 
but Bear continued relentlessly with his description of the exhausted, starving and frozen army, faced by overwhelming odds and without the fuel or ammunition to repulse the new Russian offensive. Bear gave statistics about the airlift that seemed lower than what the Luftwaffe was claiming it had delivered. And Bear had to explain that the numbers being sent were not the same as those being received. At the end of the day, what mattered was the amount landing in the pocket, not the amount getting lost in transit. He then said, It is too late for long-term planning. Six Army is at the end of its resources and demands a clear decision as to whether or not it may count on assistance and support within the next 48 hours. The narrative goes that Hitler had no real answer for Bear, and so he only spoke of the great counteroffensive he had planned. It was because of this that Bear realised that Hitler had lost touch with reality, and so Bear subsequently lost his faith in the Führer. He admitted as much the next day, and thus wasn't sent back to Stalingrad in case his lack of faith infected the troops there. However, this narrative may not be entirely true. Hitler showed signs that he did care about the troops of Stalingrad. He not only knew how bad it was in the pocket, but he had reacted to this the day before by ordering General Field Marshal Erhard Milch of the Luftwaffe to come and see him. Milch arrived at the Führer's headquarters on the 15th, and Milch was the Deputy Supreme Commander of the Luftwaffe, so only Goering was higher, and it was Milch who really ran the show. Hitler now briefed Milch on the situation in the pocket, perhaps helped by Bear's first-hand account, and told him that the Luftwaffe's airlift was failing. Placing Milch in overall command of the airlift, he said that the army would collapse if Milch couldn't improve things immediately. Obviously, this should have happened much earlier than this. If Milch had been called in late November, he may have had a significant impact. So it is curious why they waited until the 15th of January before putting a senior commander in charge. It's far too late now. In fact, as Hitler was instructing Milch on his mission, an adjutant reported that Potomnik airfield had fallen. It actually hadn't yet, but Fiebig said it had been abandoned, which was true. So Milch had the rug pulled out from under him before he'd even got started. And realistically, it's far too late now. Palace's army, or what was left of it, was already collapsing, and a few extra tons of supplies wasn't really going to do much. By the time Milch arrived, JU-52 units were temporarily unable to land within the pocket. Instead, they had to drop supplies, usually by parachute, but sometimes by less effective means, merely pushing crates out of their open doors. And just a note, oftentimes this damaged the goods when they hit the ground at high speed. The number of supply aircraft did not increase. The army languished even further. The field kitchens remained cold as there was nothing to cook in them. Even the little evening meal diminished here and there. Richthofen was not happy that Milch had been put in charge of the airlift, seeing this as a slight against himself. Jezernek reassured him that this was just done as a last-ditch effort to improve the situation for the 6th Army, not because Hitler was unhappy with him. But this didn't persuade Richthofen, and he and Fiebig felt like they were being made the scapegoats for the disaster. And this evening, another Luftwaffe general, Pickert, who had previously left the pocket, now wanted to return to Stalingrad to be with his men. Richthofen and Fiebig had refused to allow this until now. They gave in to Pickert's requests on the 15th of January, and Pickert hopped on a plane and attempted to return to Potomnik. However, as he was circling over the pocket, he received a confusing array of signals from the airfield. And with his pilot worried about running out of fuel, they decided to turn back. Colonel Adams says the 6th Army Command was furious at Pickert, thinking he'd cowardly abandoned his men. But in reality, the airfield had been overrun by the morning of the 16th. So had he attempted to land his plane, he would have been shot to pieces. So, the criticism is somewhat unfair. Or, at least, that's how Pickert described it. On the ground, the Soviets were held off from the airfield by one German tank commander from the 160th Panzer Battalion. Oberleutnant Zascher got down from his panzer, rallied the nearby infantry, and counterattacked to retake the line they had just lost. When the Soviets sent in another attack with four KV tanks, 
Zasha led four of his panzers to halt them and knock them all out. Zasha's actions prevented the Soviets from advancing for a time and earned him the Knight's Cross. However, heroic individual actions like this could only delay the inevitable, and Potomnik Airfield fell to the 21st Army not too long afterwards. A battery of 88mm flak guns fought to the last round against the advancing T-34s, but were overrun. 12 BF 109s were left behind at Potomnik and were seized by the Soviets, but 5 BF 109s managed to escape. When these 5 fighters flew to Gumrak, they discovered to their horror that there was no runway, and 4 out of the 5 crash landed, confirming that Gumrak hadn't been properly prepared. Paulus had no choice but to order his forces to establish a second defensive line to the east of Potomnik Airfield, which was a desperate move since there really wasn't any favourable terrain on which to create this line. Worse, the retreat was chaotic, with discipline beginning to break down in the ranks. An officer had to brandish a pistol to get a portion of the 3rd Motorised Division to stop retreating and the 2nd Battalion of the 518th Regiment, 295th Infantry Division, which had previously been sent from the city to help fight in the West, decided to just surrender en masse to the 38th Rifle Division. It was senseless to run away. I told my men that we would surrender in order to save lives. I feel very bad because this is the first case of a whole battalion of German troops surrendering. Rodenberg's 76th Infantry Division fell back, with only one anti-tank gun in tow, the rest being left behind. Rodenberg himself had also lost all confidence now as the end drew near. Completely exhausted, his men had to drag each other along, and 20 men from one battalion perished on the way from hunger and cold. Countless weapons and equipment were discarded on the way, and barely 100 men were left in each battalion, some of whom hadn't eaten in two days. In spite of everything, Paulus actually managed to launch a counterattack east of Potomnik with the 10 remaining tanks from 14th Panzer Division. These somehow slowed the advance of the 65th and 21st Armies and hurt the 252nd Rifle Division especially. The tank penetration regiments attached to the army had lost up to 50% of their tanks in the preceding fighting. There was also significant losses in personnel. Some of the armies had lost up to 15% of their personnel. Yet, by nightfall on the 16th of January, the defence line that 6th Army was attempting to erect had also been penetrated, in what had been the most significant day's advance for the Soviets so far. However, the Germans were now occupying the old Soviet defence lines from August, which meant that it would be harder for the Soviets to break through this line. Rokossovsky therefore decided to halt the advance here so his men could rest and refit before continuing. In their plan, it had been hoped that the 6th Army would have been destroyed by this point, the 16th of January. And despite good progress so far, this clearly hadn't happened. But it might happen soon as the Luftwaffe still struggled to supply the army. Milch was shocked to learn that the operational rate of the transport planes was only 20%, which he himself doubted. Everything was blamed on the cold, but it also makes me wonder how many were grounded due to the lack of spare parts and fuel. Despite the loss of Potomnik, Lankite of the 36th Panzer Regiment was flown out of the pocket, along with some of the other officers and staff from the 14th Panzer Division. At some point, Coleman was also flown out of Stalingrad, as was Steinmetz. And from the 10th to the 16th, 6th Army reported that the airlift had supplied 602 tons, which was an average of 86 tons per day. That average, as bad as it was, would only get worse from now on. The remaining troops were often too exhausted to retrieve the supply canisters thrown out of the Luftwaffe planes, some of which became embedded in the ground and couldn't be dug out by the half-starved troops. And if they did retrieve them, many just kept the contents for themselves. Food was no longer being supplied to the men in the western and southern positions as the pocket's logistics broke down. The officers and men are completely exhausted after days without food and the men have dragged cannon by hand 20 kilometers through snow-covered, often trackless steppe. 
back in Germany, the people were finally given a hint of what was happening at Stalingrad. They were told that the 6th Army was defending heroically against the Soviets, who were attacking from all sides. The silence was broken, and in the coming days, the regime would prepare the people for the news of the disaster that was unfolding. Paulus had to hold on long enough for Goebbels to twist the narrative in the regime's favour. But could he do so? Unlike the previous day, on the 17th of January 1943, the Soviets only advanced in a few locations, either to straighten out the front or reach local rivers and bulkers. This was because Voronov and Rokossovsky had decided that their men needed a break, and therefore they hastily worked out a new plan for the final assault upon the 6th Army. Despite the speedy pace of the advance so far, this pause would last for four days, showing that the attrition they had suffered had taken its toll. They'd lost 26,000 men in the previous seven days, and now wanted to minimise further casualties. The high cost had been worth it, since the 6th Army's pocket had been cut in half, and Paulus only had about 125,000 men left, many of whom were streaming into the city of Stalingrad. Accommodation was now becoming scarce in the city. We set up what can only be described as a hotel business. Whoever wanted shelter had to pay in goods like cigarettes, schnapps or coffee, but we preferred canned food. They were the most valuable currency. On this day, Yenneke, commander of 4th Army Corps, was wounded in the head and shoulders in a bombing attack, and Colonel Adam arranged for him to be evacuated from the cauldron several days later, along with Colonel Zeller. Pfeffer was placed in command of 4th Army Corps. Milch visited the airfields outside the pocket to see the situation firsthand, but his staff car was hit by a train on the way as it crossed some train tracks. Milch suffered a head injury and had several broken ribs, and so had to go to hospital. He refused to stay though, and after getting patched up, went back to work, relieving Victor Karganico from his position as the air supply leader for the airlift. The airfield at Zverevo, which had a lack of anti-aircraft guns, was also hit by Soviet bombers. The Soviets reported the destruction of eight Ju-52s. This was a remarkable underestimation. German reports show that 54 Ju-52s were hit, of which 12 were irrevocably lost. The situation remained depressing, however. Many Luftwaffe canisters were being dropped into Soviet hands, and the supply situation was now abysmal. Barely 10 tons had been delivered the day before, or at least had been collected and reported, and the 6th Army noted that numerous German soldiers are dying from hunger. 82 tons were delivered this day, 28 tons of ammunition and 48 tons of medical equipment, but it was simply not enough. 16th Panzer Division had to blow up four of its panzers because there wasn't enough fuel, and between the 16th and 20th of January, only 66 shells for light field artillery howitzers were delivered to the 6th Army. Paulus complained to Hitler, saying that his orders weren't being carried out, and the OKH admitted that the food situation was catastrophic. And just to ram this home, because this will become important later, the 6th Army stated that numerous soldiers were now starving to death, and this was on the 17th of January 1943. Clearly, many more would have been near starvation at this point as well, meaning that even before they had been captured and marched off to the camps, the soldiers were on the brink of death anyway, which explains the high attrition rate of the prisoners from Stalingrad compared to German prisoners captured elsewhere. Worse, discipline was breaking down at the remaining airfields. When the planes reportedly landed at Gumrak, nobody was there to unload them, so the crews had to unload it themselves whilst defending their planes with their sidearms from the hordes of deserters wanting to gain passage out of the pocket. Such scenes inevitably had a strong negative impact on the combat spirits of the German airmen. Gumrak was crammed with thousands of wounded from all around the castle. Doctors worked 18-hour tours of duty treating patients lying on cots, on floors, and outside in the snow. Delirious and pain-racked soldiers bellowed in torment as medics jabbed needles into arms crawling with grey lice. 
The temperature fell to 20 degrees below zero and the wounded cried feebly for help. When no one responded, they froze to death within a few yards of the operating table. If the airlift hadn't happened, 6th Army would have collapsed in late November or early December, and most of the men probably would have been marched into captivity, and the majority of them would have survived. But the airlift kept 6th Army fighting just enough to prolong the suffering of all involved, and resulted in a lot more death as a result. So, yeah, it did tie down 7 Soviet armies and allow Goebbels to get the Germans hyped about total war, but was that worth it? I guess in this case, the needs of the many really did outweigh the needs of the few. The Soviets remained on the defensive on the 18th of January 1943, and the Soviet commanders submitted their new plan to Stalin, who approved it in the evening. The next offensive would begin on the 20th, giving both sides time to catch their breath. That said, some of the Soviet formations attacked to improve their positions, or prevent the Germans from shifting their forces around. Batov's 65th Army managed to expand its bridgehead on the Roshoshka River's eastern bank, encircling a portion of the 44th Infantry Division. However, the 76th Infantry Division and the 14th Panzer Division moved into the area quick enough to stop them going any further. Almost all of 14th Panzer's remaining fuel was used up in this move, but they did hold the Soviets back, despite the fact that the 76th Infantry Division was now more or less out of anti-tank ammunition. Nonetheless, the Germans scrambled to form some sort of a line and fix their insurmountable supply crisis. It seems that Gumrak was now operational. But only the 6th Army knew this, meaning that few supplies were being landed at the airfield. The problem is that it's hard to say exactly what was going on because there are so many conflicting sources. Some say that Pauls and his staff informed both Hitler and Manstein that Gumrak was operational, but the message doesn't seem to have been passed on to the Luftwaffe. Others say there was nobody at the airfield to unload the supplies, which means that Paulus wasn't informed that the Luftwaffe was, in fact, landing. Jason DeMarc says that a pilot erroneously reported that the 6th Army were retreating past the airfield, and the official German history says that Richthofen and his air crews believed Gungrak was simply inadequate, so they preferred to drop supplies suggesting that it was a conscious decision not to land at Gumrak. Regardless of the exact reason, Gumrak wasn't fully operational, and Paulus asked for a Luftwaffe general to fly into the pocket to see the conditions for himself. Rather than Richthofen or Milch turning up though, it appears that they only sent a major, which proved to the 6th Army command that the Luftwaffe had given up on them. Worse, the aircraft could now only operate at night because the Red Army Air Force had gained total air superiority in the area. That day, only eight aircraft from the Ju-52 Armada took off on supply flights to Stalingrad. Five aborted due to technical difficulties, and the other three never returned. This only compounded the dropping of canisters or the landing of aircraft on the few remaining runways. At Milch's insistence, seven aircraft landed at Gumrak in the evening, and Huber was taken out of the pocket for the final time at Hitler's request, supposedly to supervise the Luftwaffe's airlift efforts, but in reality because Huber was an ace panzer commander who would be needed in the future. We must note that Milch was forcing the crews to land at Gumrak even when they didn't want to, and was therefore going over Richthofen's head. It also suggests that Richthofen wasn't making decisions that benefited the 6th Army, but only those that benefited the Luftwaffe, whereas Milch was prioritising the 6th Army over the Luftwaffe. An interesting dynamic. Milch came to the conclusion that much of the failure to supply Stalingrad from the air could be attributed to lacking spirits among the Luftwaffe's men. On the 19th, the situation was largely quiet again, as the lull in the fighting continued. Some small attacks occurred in the west, just trying to take advantage of local situations, but otherwise nothing major happened. But here's some evidence that's actually fairly important. The 6th Army complained once more about the supply situation, and Army Group Don urged the Luftwaffe to land at Gumrak, which they said was operational, 
even if the Luftwaffe hadn't realised this. However, instead of reporting that they hadn't been told that Gumrak was operational, the 4th Air Fleet decided instead to blame the weather, as well as Soviet bombings, for the reason why they weren't landing at Gumrak. This is a lie. They could have reported that Palace's HQ had been blocking Gumrak, or that they hadn't been told it was fully functional until now, but they didn't. They chose to blame the weather instead. So this is concrete proof that the 4th Air Fleet wasn't telling the truth to the German High Command about what was happening with the airlift. They couldn't admit that they, the glorious Aryan master race Luftwaffe, had messed up, and instead blamed the weather. And this goes back to what I said in episode 46, that the commanders of the Luftwaffe, Richthofen and Fiebig, were not reporting things accurately. On the 4th of January, it had been bad weather, and yet 81 transports took off. On the very next day, the weather cleared, every other type of plane from both sides took off, except for the German transport planes, who were supposedly grounded due to icing. Well, now we have clear evidence of the 4th Air Fleet on the 19th blaming the weather when it clearly wasn't the weather. People push back on me when I made this argument in episode 46, saying that sometimes it is the weather, you know. Yes, and sometimes people lie. It wasn't the weather that was preventing them from landing at Gumrak at this point. Mill should even sent seven planes to Gumrak the day before, proving that it wasn't the weather. Okay, a full quarter of the planes that did fly into the pocket from now on crash landed or suffered sufficient damage from landing that it made them unusable. However, this was largely due to the craters on the runway, not because of the snow or the weather. My overall point is that if we have evidence that there were other factors, and then they're just blaming the weather and not being honest about those other factors, why are we believing them when it comes to why the airlift failed? It would make a lot more sense if their planes couldn't take off because they didn't have enough supplies or fuel to actually conduct the airlift. Yet, because they always blame the weather, even though we have concrete evidence that it wasn't the weather on the 19th, we've just got to believe them? Huber reported to Milch that several transport planes landed in Potomnik with only half the cargo they were capable of carrying, and Milch found more to strike down on. The organisation of the Wehrmacht's entire supply system had left much to be desired for quite some time. Milch discovered that new aircraft, air crew, and other material were stuck somewhere between Germany and the Stalingrad area. Apparently, the city of Krakow, all the way back in Poland, was the bottleneck, and Milch threatened those responsible with the death penalty, which did get the supplies moving. Again, more evidence that the supply situation was the problem, not the weather. That said, the weather was causing a particular kind of issue on the 19th. The supply canisters being dropped by the Luftwaffe were dropped using light-coloured parachutes. These were hard to spot in the snow, making it difficult for the men to retrieve the packages. So the 6th Army requested that the Luftwaffe start using coloured parachutes instead. And regardless, food supplies were still not being delivered, and the combat troops were existing on whatever food they had hoarded, or simply went without. It was obvious to everyone now that this couldn't last much longer. The fortress can be held only for a few days longer. The failure of supplies to arrive has exhausted the men and rendered vehicles immobile. The last airfield will be lost shortly, so that supplies will sink to a minimum. The basis for continuing the struggle for Stalingrad is no longer there. From now on, the Russians can pierce every front. The heroism of the soldiers is still unbroken. In order to exploit this to the last beat, on the verge of this collapse, I intend to command all of the units to make an organised breakthrough to the south. Individual groups will get through, and at least create confusion in the Russian front. Whereas, while staying where they are, all will certainly perish, and, as prisoners, will die of hunger and freeze to death. Suggest a few men, officers and crews, that is, specialists, still fly out in order for you to make them available for further warfare. This order must be given soon. There is expected to be only a short period for possible flights. Request you determine these officers by name. I, myself, as a matter of course, will separate myself from them. 
Hitler rejected Powell's breakout idea the next day, on the 20th of January 1943. As Glantz points out, Manstein said Paulus dispatched this message on the 24th, five days after he did in reality, mixing it in with a request to surrender. It's not clear exactly why he did that, but it's probably to show that Paulus wasn't really serious about a breakout, since he left it so late and the disorganisation within the pocket was so great. Whereas on the 19th, when he did send the message, there is still a bit of order in the pocket and some sort of breakout could have been attempted. So by changing the dates, Manstein encouraged the myth of Paulus being passive, timid, and didn't want to break out, when in reality, he was still advocating a breakout as late as the 19th of January 1943. Apparently, on the 20th, regiment commanders were told that, upon the code word lion, they were to gather 200 men each and attempt their own breakouts. In the final days, some did attempt to break out by themselves, with a few actually succeeding to get through the Soviet lines, but none made it far. The most preposterous rumours were still buzzing through the ruins of the city. Strong German armoured forces were going to break open the pocket from the outside, all we had to do was hold out for a few more days. Everyone wavered between hope and trepidation. The reason Hitler rejected Paulus's suggestion was because, at this moment, the front line had been torn apart in the area of the Hungarian Second Army, and the Italian Alpine Corps were fighting to break out of an encirclement. If Paulus attempted to break out now, and then collapsed even faster, this could have freed seven more Soviet armies to move west, deepening the bigger crisis. So at this moment, Hitler needs Paulus to keep fighting in order to tie down Soviet forces, giving him time to fix the collapsing front. Huber, who had now reached East Prussia, was apparently angry at Hitler, telling him to kill off some of the Luftwaffe generals for failing to do their duties, and told Zeitzler that the conditions in the pocket were tragic, describing the situation as controlled human perishing, an interesting comment, considering what the National Socialists were doing throughout Europe at that time. And it was clear that everyone was blaming the Luftwaffe for the defeat, including Hitler, Manstein, Paulus, and more. Milch, Richthofen, and Fiebig were now defending the Luftwaffe's reputation, trying to pass the blame onto others, or the weather, rather than taking responsibility for what was happening. They also felt that nobody really understood the difficulties they faced. Even Goering was shocked by Huber's and Paulus' comments, and had realised that Hitler wasn't happy. In response, he attended more military conferences with the Führer, and was now ranting over the phone and his subordinates, plus sending endless telegrams to Milch and Richthofen. Responding to Huber's accusations that the Luftwaffe had delivered useless items like condoms and toilet paper to the 6th Army, Milch opened some containers to check them himself and found that many only contained fish meal. Hayward points out that not too many of these useless supplies were actually delivered to Stalingrad, but enough was getting through that Milch tried to put a stop to it by hanging the man responsible for the contents. And, to be fair, Milch does seem to have genuinely tried his best to improve the situation. To list everything he did would take forever, but in brief, he improved the airfields both inside and outside of Stalingrad. He considered using gliders to ship supplies into the pocket, but this was unworkable. He constructed aircraft repair facilities near the front, rather than having to send planes all the way back to the Reich. And there was more as well. It turns out that, for one of the airfields, the officer in charge had requested accommodation to be brought up from Germany, but the trains had been left somewhere in Russia because more important stuff had to be brought forwards. The staff at the airfields, therefore, were reporting cases of frostbite since they were living in igloos. When Milch brought up technicians from the Reich, they discovered that the crews coming up from North Africa hadn't been trained on the correct procedures to start their planes in cold conditions, and so that had to be corrected as well. And if we look at a chart of the amount of aircraft sent up throughout the Stalingrad airlift, we can see a decent increase, on average, in the final days. 
Now, it's not enough to deliver the 300 ton minimum, but if they had sent this many up throughout, the average number of tons per day probably would have gone up by about 50 or more, which is a significant amount. Bergstrom's and Haywell's description of the situation and Milch's attempts to remedy them are great accounts, and the overall impression is that Milch did have an impact. ACF said he brought the operational readiness of the transports up from 20 to 30 percent, but it was all too late. Again, had he been sent for much earlier, the situation may not have been so dire. With the lull in the fighting continuing on the 20th of January 1943, Paulus knew he could hold a little longer. However, most of Sixth Army's vehicles were now immobile, and there was no ammunition for the artillery or mortars. This was why the troops now decided to abandon their heavy equipment. The big subject is, of course, Stalingrad. We have to make ourselves familiar with the thought of informing the German people of the situation there. This should have happened ages ago. The Führer was against it so far. In Stalingrad, there are human tragedies of epic character. What our soldiers and officers perform there is beyond all imagination. Soon the situation there will be known to the public without a doubt. To some extent, they are already aware of that. I therefore think it is only right to tell the truth to help them take the horrible message and be their moral pillar. For us, Stalingrad has to become what Alcazar means for the Spanish struggle for freedom, an epic poem of German soldiership which could not be more poignant and tragic. I believe that we will be successful in binding the German people even closer to our regime and the tasks of our time with such a depiction of the fall of Stalingrad. The next phase of Operation Ring started on the 21st of January, when the Soviets conducted a reconnaissance in force in order to soften up the German defences for the main assault the next day. The front didn't move very far, but the 44th Infantry Division was all but destroyed, and the 76th Infantry Division was battered by tanks that penetrated into its rear areas. Although some remnants of the 44th Infantry Division remained, a 6 km gap was torn open in the lines, and the Soviets pushed up to a position just 5 km from Gumrak, which now came under artillery fire. The front line in the north also had to pull back to the area northwest of Volovka, with the Germans leaving most of their heavy weapons and vehicles behind. It's no wonder this happened, since the Germans were exhausted, as Hall explains. We had not received any hot food for three days. There was barely 100 grams of bread for each man, which we ate covetously as if it were cake. Milch's actions seemed to have worked to some extent, and 200 tons of supplies were delivered into the pocket on this day. At this point, the 6th Army still had something like 110,000 men, but only about 20,000 of these were combat troops, some newly trained. Glantz notes that many of the others would have resisted as best as they could at this point, so the line between combat troops and rear services personnel was now beginning to blur. On the other hand, the Soviets had over 240,000 men and about 110 tanks. And as a result of this day's actions, Merkulov's 304th Rifle Division was upgraded to the 67th Guards Rifle Division and Lagutin's 293rd Rifle Division became the 66th Guards Rifle Division. Artillery ammunition is at an end. Collapse stands before us. At 10.00 hours on the 22nd of January 1943, Soviet artillery pounded the Germans for over an hour before the Soviet armies attacked. German resistance was surprisingly fierce, meaning that the advance was slower than Rokossovsky expected. Yet, advance they did, with Pashanka and Voropanovo being captured by the evening. What was left of 3rd Motorized Division was totally out of ammunition, Gumrak was now within mortar range, and the 66th Guards Rifle Division spearheaded its advance with its field kitchens, which apparently compelled the starving Germans to surrender. By nightfall, the 76th Infantry Division was on its last legs, and the 3rd and 29th Motorized and 297th Infantry Divisions basically didn't exist anymore. 
a gaping hole in the German front line stretched between Gumrak and Pashanka, where only a few small groups continued to fight on in isolation out of fear of Soviet vengeance. Indications of disintegration on the southern, northern, and western fronts. No unified following of orders possible any longer. What orders should I give the troops who have no more ammunition and are being attacked with strong artillery, tanks, and massed infantry? Paulus then asked for a quick decision because everything was disintegrating, which was, in effect, a request by Paulus to permit the surrender of his army. Hitler, who was unhappy with Paulus's wavering attitude, responded by saying, Capitulation is out of the question. The troops will defend themselves to the last. If possible, the size of the fortress is to be reduced so that it can be held by the troops still capable of fighting. The courage and endurance of the fortress have made it possible to establish a new front and begin preparing a counter-operation. Thereby, 6th Army has made a historic contribution to Germany's greatest struggle. Hitler was asking Paulus and the 6th Army to sacrifice themselves for the greater good, which meant the Third Reich in this case. With Rostov within striking distance, those seven Soviet armies around Paulus needed to be occupied. But time was running out. Paulus could plainly see that the German troops would have to fall back into Stalingrad losing the airfields in the process. Zeitzler and Schmont show me a number of letters that came with the last courier plane from Stalingrad, not more than three or four days old. They are devastating in diction and content. Simple men writing to their homes, farewell letters, which in the whole form a massive epic poem. Imagining how these people are living like that, how long they haven't eaten. One division, for example, did not receive any provisions for four days then their posture is even more admirable. Goebbels went to see Hitler, who appeared physically shaken by what was happening. Hitler explained to Goebbels the situation, blaming the Luftwaffe and Goering's false promises about the amount of supplies that could be delivered. Schmunt separately told Goebbels that these promises had been illusory. Goering's staff had given him the optimistic picture they presumed he wanted, and he had passed this on to the Führer. It was a problem that afflicted the entire dictatorship, up to and including Hitler himself. Only positive messages were acceptable. Pessimism, which usually meant realism, was a sign of failure. Distortions of the truth were built into the communication system of the Third Reich at every level, most of all in the top echelons of the regime. This attitude was baked into the cake. This was mind over matter, literally. The ideology said that reality could be overcome by the will of the human spirit, which is where Hitler's standfast idea comes from as well. And Hitler agreed with Goebbels' idea of using Stalingrad as a symbol of struggle to radicalise the total war drive that they were planning. And so Goebbels immediately instructed the press. But Hitler told Goebbels that he still hoped that a portion of the Sixth Army could hold out until relieved. This was obviously unlikely to happen, but the fact that he said this to Goebbels indicates that Hitler had a genuine desire to save the situation. He didn't just forget about the Sixth Army, and was actually hoping for some miracle to occur. Of course, there was little hope now. All that remained was trying to soften the blow for the German people, which is partly why Hitler didn't want Paulus to surrender. And Paulus wouldn't surrender, as we'll find out next time. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.